So does Kamala Harris support building a border wall? Tonight, that question now raised to the forefront of the presidential campaign. Here on the Hill, we are speaking with the chief architect of the bipartisan border bill. Plus, Jack Smith not backing down. The special counsel filing a new indictment with a new grand jury against Donald Trump. Also this evening, housing in America. Part of the American dream, now 5% more expensive. I'll show you how prices are adding up, specifically in the swing states. Plus why Donald Trump wants Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s help and hasn't reached out to Nikki Haley, what we are hearing here on the Hill, along with Mark Zuckerberg's mea culpa, telling House Republicans he's sorry why the White House is not apologizing. Welcome to Washington. You are watching the most politically unpredictable show on all of television. I'm Blake Berman. This is The Hill on News Nation. Ten weeks from this very moment, we will be able to tell you the first polls are closing in parts of Kentucky and in Indiana, the rest of the country to follow in the upcoming hours. But before then, there is a long way to go. For example, we woke up this morning to this article in Axios, quote, Harris flip-flops on building the border wall. Democrats today saying that's not necessarily the case. By the way, same with Republicans. We'll speak with the Republican architect of that bill, Senator James Lankford, later here on the Hill. But first tonight, Jack Smith. Back in action after the Supreme Court ruled earlier this summer that presidents have immunity for official acts while in office. The special counsel announcing today that he narrowed some of the allegations and with it, a new grand jury indicting Donald Trump on four charges for his attempts, they say, to try to overturn the 2020 election. Joining me here on the Hill throughout the hour, Nan Hayworth, former congresswoman from the state of New York. Scott Bolden, News Nation political contributor. Ashley Davis, former official in the George W. Bush White House. Brad Howard, senior aide to House Democrats, former aide. Hello to you all. Nice to have you all in. It's been a fast moving yeah, <laughs> afternoon with a lot to get to here. Um, I want to start with you, Scott. By the way, Mick Mulvaney, former White House chief of staff in the Trump administration, come on in, News Nation contributor as well. Let's start with Jack Smith real quick. I want sort of both of your perspectives from both sides of the aisle here, Mick. Uh, what do you think Jack Smith is trying to do here, and what do you think it means for Donald Trump? Well, I think what he's trying to do is just work around the decision regarding presidential immunity, but what he's actually doing, that's the legal answer. The political answer is, I think he just helped Donald Trump. Keep in mind, um, Trump was using that victimization m- message to sort of keep him alive in this race, and he'd been doing it very successfully. You haven't heard much about that message at all since the Joe Biden debate. Now it's front and center. I actually think this could be a huge political shot in the arm for the Trump team. Uh, Scott, same question to you. Jack Smith, what's he doing and what does it mean for Donald Trump 70 days out? Well, legally and procedurally, he's reduced the original indictment by nine or 10 pages, took out Jeffrey Clark, who's no longer a defendant, and took out any conversations or influence with DOJ between Donald Trump and DOJ. That's the first thing. Second of all, this is all baked in. This is one of many uh, cases that he is, criminal cases he's facing. Uh, I don't think it, if it helps Donald Trump fundraise with MAGA, that's fine. It just reminds independents and that sliver of voters who are out there still trying to understand and figure out who they're going to vote for uh, that he still uh, has this criminal indictment. All right, Mick, we will see you here in a few minutes. Um, Housing prices. I'm going to get into that and what we're seeing in the swing states as as new numbers were out today. Mick, I'll catch you in about uh, 15 minutes on that. Thank you, sir. All right. Joining us now here on the Hill is the attorney general from the state of Minnesota, former congressman as well. Keith Ellison, he is a supporter, by the way, of Vice President Harris. Mr. Attorney General, thanks for being with us here on the Hill. Let's start with the big news real quick. Yeah. Hello to you as well. Start with the big news in the past hour and a half or so. Jack Smith superseding indictment. Do you think Kamala Harris wants this right now, 70 days out? I think Kamala Harris as a prosecutor is focused, uh, it wants the criminal justice system to hold people accountable who commit crimes. I think as a candidate, she's trying to talk to as many voters as she can. At the end of the day, uh, you really cannot run a criminal justice system that is sensitive to the political cycle. 
Uh, I don't think she's worrying about it one way or another. I think she's trying to talk to more voters and uh, help more people understand why she's the best choice. But uh, I, honestly, I think it's okay. probably not on her radar. Uh, not on a radar. OK, let's move on then real quick. You're the attorney general in Minnesota, as I mentioned. I know one of the things that's on your focus is social media companies and sort of the harmful effects that they have on children. You've been on the forefront yes. of that in your state. There was a big story that dropped at around this time late in the hour last night as it relates to Meta and Mark Zuckerberg. Meta, of course, the biggest one of them all. Uh, here's what Zuckerberg said in his letter to the House Judiciary Committee. He said, quote, in 2021, senior officials from the Biden administration, including the White House, repeatedly pressured our teams for months to censor certain COVID-19 content, including humor and satire. Mark Zuckerberg now says he regrets essentially how Meta acted. Did the White House get this wrong, Mr. Attorney General? Well, the Meta got a lot of things wrong. Meta needs to look at how what its about the algorithms. White House? No, I heard what you said. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously you're asking me that for because of the political environment. But if you want to talk about who got people got things wrong, Meta got a lot of things wrong. It's good they apologize for it. There's more that they've done wrong, and uh, you know we're holding them accountable in the courtroom to try to get them. To, to, to answer for all of the things that they've done that they should not have done, including manipulating their uh, algorithms uh, to that have led kids to do and be involved in a lot of things that are extremely dangerous and unhealthy. So uh, did the White House get it wrong? Meta, Meta got it wrong, and I'm glad at least he has a decency to apologize for some of the things that he got wrong. So here was the White House today, quote, they were asked about this. Our position has been clear and consistent. We believe tech companies and other private actors should take into account the effects their actions have on the American people while making independent choices. I didn't see an apology there. Sometimes in Washington, that's one of the hardest things to do. Do you 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 think that strikes the right tone from the White House? You should apologize when you do things wrong. I mean, what I heard from your story and from other reporting and from uh, the, the complaint we filed against Meta is that they've done some things that they should not have done. Maybe they did some things in the eyes of the Judiciary Committee that they shouldn't have done. We, me and several other AGs uh, on a bipartisan basis believe that they've done other things wrong with regarding how they manipulate their, uh, their, uh, their algorithms to uh, entice, lure, and get young people to engage in unhealthy behaviors. They might want to apologize for that, too. I hope that they do. uh, And I think that would make things better if they did. Keith Ellison, there's a lot to get into, a lot of breaking news, though, at this hour. um, So we got to leave it there. Thank you so much, the attorney general from the state of of Minnesota. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. You got it. We'll talk to you again soon. Um, This dropped at about 650 last night here. So it was like at the very tail end of our show. Republicans, can they say, told you so now? Is that kind of where this is? Are you fine with the way Mark Zuckerberg handled this? Where are you two on it? Well, I actually don't understand why Democrats and are continuing to criticize the tech industry, but the tech industry still supports Democrats. I mean, it's crazy to me that this happens. And I actually think Zuckerberg was very forward thinking about saying that what happened. Yeah, uh, there uh, must be some reason he's decided to be so forthright. But what struck me the most about what he said yesterday was the fact that the FBI flagged uh, before it was ever revealed to the public that there was a disinformation event, a Russian disinformation event that they expected regarding uh, the Biden family and Burisma. And lo and behold, just a month or so later, uh, out comes the Here, evidence about the laptop. Yeah. That should chill us all, because clearly that was an effort to influence the election here, here was, by the FBI. Here was Mark Zuckerberg in his letter. He said, quote, it's since been made clear that the reporting was not Russian disinformation. And in retrospect, we shouldn't have demoted the story. We changed our policies and processes to make sure this doesn't happen again. Why do you think he's coming out with this now? I'm sure it's some preventative uh, getting ahead of some cons- uh, Criticisms he's probably going to get for how he operates this cycle. I think both parties are mad at him. Democrats obviously mad of 
uh, uh, that these algorithms are kind of messing up children and or Democrats have legislation on the Hill that are trying to get hold social media companies accountable to the effects they're having on our children. But I think to Ashley's point is, yeah, they may be supporting Democrats, but at the end of the day, Democrats care about policy in, in the children there. And I think secondly is you're looking at a situation here where this, this is a tough area, right? Like, the government has a responsibility to make sure that we're not falling victim to disinformation from foreign adversaries, but at the same time, the government should not be the truth tellers here. So on so the flip, like, on how the do flip you do of that, that, like if Donald Trump wins the presidency, you don't want a Trump administration right. telling whatever, oh, this is true or, or this is not. And that's a, kind of exactly what the White House and it says the FBI essentially was doing. Well, but you're comparing apples and oranges. This was during COVID. We were trying to save lives. We were in uncharted territory, and people make mistakes. So if the Republicans and Democrats make mistakes, or if Zuckerberg and his company make mistakes during a crisis period of time, we're trying to save lives and keep all Americans safe, I'll accept that as a voter. Sure. But that's not what he said. No. He said he was pressured to make certain. Yeah. 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 Right. Pressured, pressured to save lives. By the White House. Pressured to take false and disinformation down. Not just what he apologized for, but I'm talking about in regard to COVID. There was a lot we knew and did not know, and we're trying to save lives and keep all Americans safe. There are going to be mistakes made. So w- w- what's the blame game about here? So here was Mark Zuckerberg on Joe Rogan's podcast a couple of years ago, at least more than a year ago. I'll get your reaction on the other side. The FBI, I think, basically came to us, uh, some, some folks on our team, and was like, hey, um, just so you know, like, you should be on high alert. There was the, we, we thought that there was a lot of Russian propaganda in the 2016 election. We have it on notice that basically there's about to be some kind of dump. And now, you, so it's one thing to go on Joe Rogan, right, and, and say that, or any popular podcast. It's another to write a letter to Congress, yes. which is what he did last night. And again, uh, let me leave you with this. I, I wonder why he's doing this now. Uh, I think he is probably concerned about the way in which the coming weeks are going to unfold and what kind of pressures will be placed on social media companies. Since we know, apropos to the point about Jack Smith's new indictment against President Trump, we know that lawfare is a prominent feature of this election, and that should concern every American. Something's coming. Do you think right. something's coming? The Department well, of Justice coming. is being yeah. used Look, against Donald this, Trump and against Republicans. This is going to be a problem that's going to plague all, all, all the elections in, in the upcoming, in the next 10 elections probably. But it's up to voters to, to know, to verify your information, to make sure when you read something, does it sound true? Try to go to your local journalist, independent journalist, try to confirm this information because social media is just full you know, of lies. You know, you know what I say? You know what I say? I, you know what I say? Pressure. This, well, this is government. part of the reason why I'm bullish television news long term. You come to places like here. Exactly. For the facts. <laughs> All right. So look, I'm here on the Hill. Americans remain frustrated with housing prices. Mick Mulvaney joining us on the other side of the break. I'm going to break down for you what is happening, especially in the swing states with prices. Hello, Mick. Plus, Vice President Harris, is she flipping on another issue, this time on the border wall? Senator James Langford, the Republican architect of the famous bill, joins us here on the Hill. And have you seen this? Extra security measures for J.D. Vance as he rallies outside in Michigan. Bulletproof glass. For a vice presidential candidate, is that the new normal? We're back in three minutes here on The Hill. The Hill on News Nation, housing, one of the top issues for voters this election cycle. Today, Vice President Harris is putting it at the center of her campaign by releasing a new ad called Full House. It highlights Harris's experience as a renter and her commitment to fixing the housing crisis. I know what home ownership means. And sadly, right now, it is out of reach for far too many American families. We will end America's housing shortage by building 3 million new homes and rentals. Okay, so we got some new information out today as to just how big the problem is. This is known as the the Case-Shiller Report. It essentially takes the 20 largest cities all across the country and sees what's going on with housing there. Here's the top line number. Prices over the past year have risen by basically five and a half percent. For some context there, a $500,000 home last year, about $525,000 this year. A million, a million, 50,000, for example. But we talk about this election, right, all the time, obviously. In the 20 biggest states, 
A handful of them are in the swing states. Let me show you what's going on there. So remember, average at about 5.5%. Look out west to Vegas, higher than that, 8.5%. Nevada. Uh, Come on over to Detroit. Michigan, huge state, 7% there, price increase. Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, 6.5%. Atlanta, basically right there on the number. Phoenix, only up 3.7%. So that's sort of what voters in those key major, in those swing states, in the big cities there, are feeling with housing. But that's just one year, right? Let's go all the way back to the start of the Biden-Harris administration, and that tells a much Different and bigger picture, you could say. We'll just work our way east to west. Charlotte, housing prices up 50%, basically, over the last uh, three and a half years. Detroit, 30%. Doesn't look that awful, even though I'm sure it it, it is for many folks there. Atlanta, 46%. Phoenix, 42%. 40% in Vegas. It's great if you own a home, right? That's equity in your home. If you're trying to achieve the American dream, that is what they are dealing with in the swing states. Come on in, Mick Mulvaney. Once again, former Trump White House chief of staff. That's what a lot of folks know you as. But Mick, um, as I know, you got your start in politics and housing. You're from a family of, of home builders. Here's Kamala Harris's plan, for example. She wants to uh, build 3 million new homes over four years, include a $25,000 down payment support for eligible first-time home buyers. Can the, can, could a possible President Harris fix this? You know, a president can help. There's no question about it. We talked about this a little bit last week on the show. The ideas of, of giving that down payment assistance, if done correctly, can help. But keep in mind, if it's done improperly, like, say, making it really easy to borrow money to go to college, you can see nothing but prices go up on housing, as we have seen with prices of education go up. Uh, but the real thing here, the real challenge is when she says we are going to build three, three million new houses. That's not the government. I don't know who thinks she, she thinks is going to build the houses. There's actually folks who, companies who go out and build them. And they would build them, by the way, if you let them today. Here's the primary reason for the housing shortage in the country. It's too hard to get permission to build houses. This is the not in my backyard, the NIMBY movement. People who NIMBY, have yeah. houses don't want more in their neighborhood. They like it the way that they, the way that things are right now. And they, they put pressure on local politicians not to approve new housing. Hmm. Local decisions on land use um, are local. They are state and primarily local yeah. government. The federal government has very little to do with it. So you can do what you want to with the federal government. You can say all you want to. But until you solve that local problem, you're really not going to. Okay going to resolve this supply and demand uh, disconnect that we have in the country and have had for more than 20 years. Here was J.D. Vance earlier today on this very issue. I'll get your reaction on the other side. We should stop foreign investors from buying up American property. The second related point is, look, we have 25 million illegal aliens in this country. They're competing with Americans for scarce homes. That is fundamentally going to increase demand and thus drive up the cost of housing for American citizens. And we also have a supply problem. We're not building enough, right? It's too hard to build things in this country. Now, partially that's because energy is too expensive. So let's bring down the cost of energy. Is that the right answer there, Mick? He's partly pinning it on immigration. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how many illegal immigrants are buying a house, um, but certainly it would it w- would affect folks on the margin. The, the prices uh, issue is is correct. Uh, energy has a, has, a, has a large component of building a house because things like uh, roofing shingles are made out of petroleum products. Wood can be very expensive in certain markets and so forth. So inflation is real and it filters through to the price of a house. Yeah. So he's got some of the pieces and parts, but the bottom line is simply supply and demand. Right now, it's not it's not possible to build as many houses as Americans want. And until you fix that, you're not going to solve this problem. Mick, hang around here for a second. Let's, let's put that graphic up um, of what's going on the last three and a half years because I look at what's going on in the swing states, in the major cities there. I mean, you're talking 30, 40, 50 percent, Brad. Well, look, I, I bought my first home a year ago this month. Um, it was that down payment is rough. Yeah. So I can tell you that 25000 would go a long way. And she's the only one talking about this issue right now. So I think it's What about folks who say, wait a minute, I bought a, ho- I bought, I bought a home last year. But there, I didn't get the 25 the difference is there, are, there are communal benefits to home ownership. That re- it leads to 
safer communities. It leads to people investing in their communities and caring about their communities. So there's a communal benefit to owning a home here. I'll add, too, that I'm running for local office here in D.C. and A&C. I went around, and I heard from several longtime residents they don't want to build more of those where they take one unit and turn it into four right. they, because of the NIMBY build movement. That. And that's, that's what Mick's talking exactly. about. Exactly. So Mick's absolutely right. That is a real issue. Isn't this hey, what Detroit, happened during Clinton, though, those, that uh, he gave so much money to housing and then it, what led to the downturn in 2007, 2008? Uh, that's kind of... W. Bush, too. Listen, in, in Detroit, up 70% is a good thing in if that market own. because they just came out of bankruptcy about 5, 10 years ago, and you could buy a whole block for $100,000 <laughs> probably 5, 10 years ago. The healthy way to do uh, these things is, as Mick says, make it easier to buy, to build homes, but also make money less expensive. And the inflation that we have experienced since President Biden and Vice President Harris took office has been enormously costly for our society and for those among us who are at the starting phase of their lives. And unless we get inflation under control, and that's a government spending issue. To to, to lower it, though, that part of the Federal Reserve's job, if they go down that that road with interest rates, I'll give you the last word. There's there's two things. Who's going to pay for the 25000 One. But Sorry, Mick. But the other thing is is that um, how... Is she saying that this isn't her problem that she's done for the last three and a half years? I just don't understand how she's running as she's not an incumbent. Mick, last word. Yeah, to Ashley's point, that's going to be the case across the board, right? She has been the, the, the incumbent for the last three years. Since Brad said something nice about me, I'll say something nice about this proposal. There's I'll actually one piece of the, uh, of, the, of the Harris proposal that makes some sense, which is to make more federal lands available for housing. We've seen this in Washington, D.C. Mm. During the Trump administration, we actually did turn over some surplus federal buildings that are now turning into apartments and condominiums in Washington, D.C. It's going to scratch the surface. It's only going to be li- those benefits be limited to certain markets, but at least it's sort of an indication of the how to fix the problem. Mick Mulvaney, former Trump White House chief of staff, got his start in politics with, home, uh, with housing. Mick, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thanks, y'all. You got it. Catch you soon. All right. Still much more ahead here on the Hill. Does Vice President Harris want to continue speaking of building? Does she want to build a border wall? Senator James Lankford, the, the Republican who was in charge of negotiating the bipartisan deal, joins us on the other side of the break. Four minutes out. You're watching the Hill. Welcome back here to the Hill on News Nation in Washington today. We woke up to this headline in the morning from Axios. Quote, Kamala Harris flip-flops on building the border wall. Now, what you are hearing today from some Democrats and and talking to, to some as well is that they'll say this wasn't necessarily a flip at all because, as they put it, the bipartisan border bill was a compromise. That's what you want, Washington, right? They'll argue compromise. It's a good thing, they say. Now, it included, by the way, that bill, border wall funding, addressing staffing shortages, better technology at the southern border, and clamp down on asylum claims. Now, Kamala Harris has leaned into this bill recently, in part, to try to pin it on Donald Trump, who killed it earlier this year. For example, here was Harris at the Democratic National Convention. I refuse to play politics with our security, and here is my pledge to you. As president, I will bring back the bipartisan border security bill that he killed, and I will sign it into law. But Republicans point to Harris's past opposition to the border wall and that she was a very vocal critic while she was in the Senate. Senator J.D. Vance, the only candidate out on the trail today, for example, suggested that the upcoming presidential debate could look something like this. I've heard that for her debate in just a couple of weeks, she's going to put on a navy suit, a long red tie, and adopt the slogan, Make America Great Again. All right, joining us now is the architect of that bipartisan border bill. He is the Republican senator from the state of Oklahoma, back here on the Hill, James Lankford. Senator Lankford, thanks for being back with us. Appreciate it as always, sir. Good to see you again. Yep, um, great to speak with you. So you helped put this bill together. Kamala Harris now says she supports this bill. As a Republican, do you give her credit for supporting what you put together? Well, I, I, it's hard for me to give her credit on it that she was never a part of any of the negotiations. We had negotiations for four months on this. She or her staff 
never appeared, not one phone call, not one Zoom meeting, not one live meeting. So it's interesting that they are now embracing it when for four months we had to fight to be able to get this bill actually pulled together. Uh, literally Did for you ever four try months to reach they didn't out want to, to do any of it. Well, we worked with the White House team and they brought in who they chose uh, to be a part of the negotiating team. We negotiated with Chris Murphy and with uh, Kirsten Cinema in October and November. The White House then joined us in late November. And uh, we never had anyone from the vice president's staff that was ever tapped to be able to be in it, nor the vice president ever in that. Uh, at the time in February, Senator, once and, and for those who who don't remember, you had helped negotiate this with Chris Murphy, Democrat on the other side. The White House was involved at that time. Donald Trump had just made his way essentially through the primary process. It became right. clear that he was going to be the Republican nominee for president. And he voiced his displeasure. And that was basically it. And you went to the Senate floor in February. You said this at the time. I, I want to ask you about it on the other side. If you try to move a bill that solves the border crisis during this presidential year, I will do whatever I can to destroy you. They have been faithful to their promise and have done everything they can to destroy me. You haven't been destroyed, Senator. Uh, you're, you're still here, as, as we can see and as we're talking to you. Um, but I wonder if you think it was a mistake for Republicans not to go forward with it, especially now that Kamala Harris is running on it. And say, you know what, if we win, then we'll make changes. Yeah, let me clarify a couple of things. Donald Trump is not the one who said that he would work to destroy me on that. That was some conservative commentators that would call right. me behind the scenes and say they were outspoken yep. on that. Donald Trump never made a call to me to be able to say one way or the other on it. I did talk to some of his team during that time period. He said some of these elements would actually be very helpful when they're elected. And some of them said, hey, we don't like all of it. Uh, there was this theme that ran through all of it. If we can't get everything, we shouldn't get anything on it because we need to get everything. There's a lot more that needs to be done. And by the way, I agree, there's a lot more that needs to be done. But I'm looking at this from a national security perspective to say for national security's sake, we should close down as much of the border as we possibly can right now. And working with the White House it was very clear they didn't want to do any of it. And at that time, for three years, had chosen to do nothing but open the border up. And during the negotiations, so, had drugged their feet through the whole process. My emphasis was we should get as much done as we possibly can get done, do that, then come back and do the rest. But we've got a national security crisis. We should focus in on that. So we had our, our, our the Hill DDHQ uh, forecast unveiled yesterday, Senator, for the first time, which showed if, if it's right, Right now, Kamala Harris is the favorite to win the presidency, and Republicans are the favorites to control the building here behind me in Washington, the Capitol. If that is indeed the dynamic, and if she lives up to her word that this is the, the bipartisan bill that she wants, would you put it forward again then? Well, every bill has a life expectancy. There are aspects of this bill, including that border wall funding that actually expires by the end of the year. And she's very keenly aware of that. There's $650 million in border funding that's still left unallocated uh, from the time period when President Trump was president. The Biden administration has used much of that money to the tune of billions of dollars on it. They've used that dollars to do environmental remediation along the border rather than border wall construction. What I was trying to do in February was to get this bill passed to be able to stop the hemorrhaging at the border, but also to be able to make sure that funding was no longer used for environmental remediation, but it was actually used for what it was intended for, building the border barrier itself. That's the wall, that's the road next to the wall, that's the fiber optics, that's the cameras. That's what it was intended for. They've not been spending it for that. That money, in all likelihood, that $650 million, they will spend on everything else but wall. So by the time we get to next year, we could pass this bill, but the border wall funding would probably already been spent by this administration for things not border wall related. Senator James Langford, got to leave it there. We, we, we know you hustle to the camera. I appreciate it, sir. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. You bet. Glad to connect. You got it. All right. Have a good one. Meantime, Donald Trump appears to be trying to win over more voters with the help of two former Democrats. The Trump campaign announcing today that the former Democratic Congresswoman, former Democratic presidential candidate, Tulsi Gabbard and... Robert F. Kennedy Jr. are now on the transition team. Now, he doesn't disagree with us on everything, and of course, we don't agree with him on everything, but it really is an amazing realignment that we're witnessing in American politics. Now, this comes as RFK Jr. may not be able to pull his name off the ballot in several states, swing states, including Nevada, Michigan, Wisconsin, North Carolina, maybe as well. All right, um, Ashley, you are very close to Nikki Haley. 
Yeah. And I see Donald Trump going after disaffected Democrats, RFK Jr., Tulsi Gabbard. I don't see him out there front and center with Nikki Haley. Is that a mistake? And why is he not doing it? Well, to be fair, he did say I would like her on the campaign trail when he was asked. And but it hasn't happened. No. And she said that she would do it. But I think it's up to him to ask her. If, uh, sounds like, it sounds like dating but in don't high school. You, okay, or, it does. Or, you know, but, um, but this is a presidential campaign. I agree. But um, does, she, she, does he need her more than she needs him? Maybe. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he's he's the one at the top. Yeah, and especially with Kamala right now, I mean, she's taking votes. You'll agree with me, Nan. I mean, she's taking votes that we had. So, I, I'll, I'll get to you in a second, but I wonder what you're hearing on the front of when you think the moment is that Donald Trump will actually reach out to her and say, "All right, I, I need you for." Uh, I don't know when he's going to do it. I know from talking to her team and and having lots of conversations with her, she's moved on with her life. I mean, mm. she is doing a lot of foreign policy, what she believes in. And when he asks her, she'll do it, but he needs to ask her. I agree with Ashley. I think President <laughs> Trump should ask her. Should it, it should have happened yesterday? Uh, I wouldn't have objected if it had happened yesterday. I, it, it's, it, and I was heartened by the fact that President Trump has apparently made peace with Governor Kemp. Uh, of Georgia. So obviously, President Trump understands that in order to win, there are certain uh, expediencies that must be observed. And I think having Governor the woman connection is, is not should not be lost on this election. OK, uh, to uh, the two de- Democrats are the least un- are the least popular Democrats on the Democratic Party. So <laughs> they don't draw away one bit from this movement called Kamala Harris. But what about in an election where if RFK Jr. moves 10, 15, 20,000 people in Arizona, for example, that could that's it. Yeah, it's obviously a concern. I think they should give RFK Jr. a microphone and go let him campaign all over the country for Donald <laughs> Trump uh, at this point. And I'd like to be clear. Tulsi Gabbard left the Democratic Party, I think, like four years ago. So a little while she's been popular then. All right. Still to come here helpful. on the Hill. This was remarkable, I thought, today. J.D. Vance, vice presidential candidate, behind bulletproof glass for the first time as he took to the stage in Michigan. Would you look at that? Is that really our future, America? Is that what we're going to see out of our presidential candidates? Former Secret Service agent joins us on the other side of the break. Plus, Trump versus the Foo Fighters? Why the former president is in a fight with one of the biggest well-known rock bands. Special guest Bill O'Reilly on Cuomo. Cuomo O'Reilly is the best cable news exposition <laughs> in America. Toe to toe and TV's liveliest, most honest debate. Appreciate your Bill O'Reilly. Tomorrow at 8, 7 Central, only on News Nation. Candidates, it's unacceptable. Welcome back here to the Hill on News Nation. That was Congressman Jason Crow, Democrat, yesterday in Butler, Pennsylvania, where just 45 days ago, A shooter attempted to assassinate Donald Trump. Today, his running mate, the senator from Ohio, J.D. Vance, spoke to a crowd in Michigan, where, as you can see here in a moment, he's walking out there. He stood behind bulletproof glass, the vice presidential candidate. It's the first time the VP candidate spoke from behind that glass at a solo event. He had done so before with Trump. But that today for Vance for the very first time. Joining us now, the former Secret Service Special Agent, uh, CEO of Sentinel Security Solutions, Charles Marino. Charles, nice to have you on back. Appreciate it. I saw this and I just thought to myself, man, this looks awful. We have a vice presidential candidate. And, uh, you know, I, I just wonder if this is the it looks awful because I just wonder if this is the new reality going forward. And this is just going to be the way forward for anyone on either side running for the highest office. Well, I agree. It's unfortunate. And we're starting to see the Secret Service. Maybe a better word, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, unfortunate for sure. But what I can tell you is we're starting to see the Secret Service deploy resources and tools like the ballistic glass that reflect the overall threat environment within the country presently. And also the specific protective intelligence with respect to former President Trump and now J.D. Vance. While these specific threats may not always be directed towards J.D. Vance, he absorbs many of these threats just by being on the ticket. If, if Kamala Harris and Tim Walls do outdoor events like this, should we expect to see the same? Or is this just specific to the Republican side right now because of what we saw in Butler? 
No, I think based on the overall threat environment and the preference of the Secret Service, especially after the failed assassination attempt, expect to see it for both sides of the aisle here. I think Mm -hmm. this is a tool that the Secret Service is going to be more comfortable having at these outdoor rallies. Again, they can control what they can. This is for the longer uh, outer threats uh, from long guns uh, like sniper rifles, et cetera, that may not be mitigated uh, 100 percent in the way that the Secret Service would like. So this is an added so, layer of security. So, you know, we think about or I, I, someone said it on this show a couple of weeks ago and it struck me when they said it, which was the Pope mobile. Right. We're just kind of used to the Pope riding around in that glass box and I don't know, like, that's just sort of the way I'm used to seeing the Pope. It's been that way for most of my life. Is, is that the new normal going forward into 28 and 32 that, and beyond that this is what we're going to see? Well, something like the ballistic glass has always been made available and utilized by sitting presidents and vice presidents, especially when holding large outdoor rallies overseas. But now that we're seeing the extension to the candidates, including former presidents that we wouldn't have typically seen before, tells me that there's been a a shift in strategy. Instead of resourcing to the specific title uh, and what the Secret Service thought they should or should not have had, they are now staffing and providing resources that are specific to the threat level. And that's important. I think that's where it needs to be. Okay. Charles Marino, former Secret Service Special Agent. Nice to speak with you as always, sir. Catch you next time. Thank you, Blake. Uh, you just reminded me that this was the case. You, you remember everything post 9-11. You were in the White House post 9-11. You, yeah, like, this but- happened then. But also what, what, sh- what makes me very sad is that was foreign threats, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we, our vice president, our president, obviously Cheney and Bush, uh, had the same thing. And uh, now we're doing it with domestic terrorists. Well, there are threats from, from Iran the- against Donald Trump. And it's been that way for, since the, the killing of Absolutely, uh, Soleimani. Absolutely, and all the illegal immigrants that are But you know what's really border. troubling? <laughs> well, no, th- uh, this is specific to Iran. Uh, I know. And, and the killing of Soleimani. I know, I know, what's I know. What's really know. troubling yeah, about, about all of this is that these are public servants. These are public figures. Yeah. They're sides. elected officials. They have kids. J.D. Vance should. is my age, and he has kids. Exactly. Uh, yeah, the public ought to have kids. access to these elected officials, uh, shaking hands, pressing the flesh, and that ballistic glass just runs counter to all of that. All right, meantime, Vice President Harris, Governor Tim Walls will sit down, we learned today, for their first interview, a joint interview, since the campaign began. The interview will be on CNN uh, later this week. So a couple things to note here. It's been, this will be close to 40 days. <laughs> It's a joint interview, which means if she needs a little bit of help, Brad, I know you're scoffing at me, but that's the way this works. If she needs a little bit of help, guess who's there? Coach. No, this this is, this. I think you saw the energy that emerged from the convention around this ticket. This is a ticket. This is the most pro-family ticket we've seen in modern American politics. It is the ticket that's driving the excitement. I don't think it's just fine to bring in your vice president and say, we are the two that are going to be leading this country for the next four years if you go for us. Super weird. I don't think it's I love, I love Tim Walls. I think he's a great addition to this ticket. This is the first time that they that that a president and vice president yeah. who are nominated. Oh no, I'm not. Party, say, I'm not saying that. I'm interview. not saying a joint. It's not the first time. No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. Okay. I'm not saying that is unusual. Mm-hmm. But for the first time, for her and Nan shaking her head, yeah. you, this, this is pe- folks care about Kamala Harris. Right. Mm-hmm. They care about Donald Trump, right? Because one of those two is going to be the president of the United States. Yeah. Yeah. And then the first time. She's not sitting down by herself. They are building a campaign on the on the fly after 40 days. America needs to get to know both of them. It doesn't bother so, me one, one bit. Here's, here's, like here's one thing that I think the audience should know. There was a story out in Politico today. Can we show the, the graphic real quick, which basically went into the decision of doing this interview? It's an <laughs> interview, folks. Uh, here's what Politico reported, that these were all the people that could be in the conversation as to who gets it. When does it happen on what network? For an interview, is, it, it looked like the, the the chain of command to the nuclear codes, is, not an interview. I think it's actually yeah. doing her disservice having him there. But go ahead. I, it, it, you, this uh, it, uh, Vice President Harris is vying to become the leader of the free world. The threat array that she faces is extraordinary. 
And we, they have to have this level of decision making merely to have an interview. Do you want her? That's do you want insane. them to just let her go? Like just be just be Kamala and let her out there? Look, there is an immense amount of risk in campaigns, and right now things are going extremely well for Kamala Harris and Tim Waltz. I keep doing what they're doing for now. Okay. Carefully control the narrative, and you can win in November. By the way, did you happen to see this? The Trump campaign has a new adversary. Last week, when introducing RFK Jr. at his rally, the Trump team played a Foo Fighters song. The problem, though, the band says they never gave permission to use their song, saying if they were, quote, they would not have granted it. They added appropriate actions are being taken, they say, against the campaign, and any royalties received as a result would be donated to the Harris Walls campaign. This happens all the time so, on both so sides. Never Someone lost plays so, it. So, 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 so you're saying there's a Foo Fighters fight? There's a Foo Fighters <laughs> fight. You could have uh, written that. I know, yeah. Want to write the next one? Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's all good. Uh, let's just leave it to this. Get excited. Football almost back in the NFL yes. with a huge decision today. I'll explain it. Other side of the break, Leland Vitter joins us. Stay with us. All right, welcome back here to The Hill. So the National Football League may have some new faces sitting in the owner's box as soon as next year. The league has long barred private equity firms from buying stakes in teams, but that has now changed with new rules being approved by owners that could inject a ton of money into what is already the most lucrative sports league in the country. Among the initial approved equity firms, private equity firms, uh, you might know Blackstone, that's one, Sixth Street as well. Leland Vitter. Host of On Balance. This is just going to... I'm looking at the headline yeah. here. I think we should rewrite it. Which is? NFL owners vote to make themselves richer. Richer, yeah. That, that's, that's one thing that's definitely going to happen. By the way, I think this is just the start. I think private equity is going into college football, too. Because the money that can be made there, okay. you know how this works. Like, they're going to try to find every little angle. Every, every dollar. And, you know, I'm always reminded about what Warren Buffett said. What would happen to the price of Major League Sports teams if their owners could not see their name in newspapers or their <laughs> face on television during the game, yeah. the price would go in half. Yep. Um, what you got coming up on the show tonight? You got George Will uh, cool. about what I would argue is the most important debate of our time, which is hmm. censorship, lack thereof, 